keys, I think it's reasonable to assume that like, well, we're not concerned about an attack where Eve tries all possible to the 1,000 keys. So the main assumption made in cryptography theory is this, that your adversary, or Eve, is, and this is some cryptography terminology, PPT, but that just stands for probabilistic polynomial time algorithm. So the main assumption is that you, even though the adversary is working against you, you still model them as though they're a polynomial time algorithm. In fact, you model all the participants as algorithms, but particularly you model the, the adversaries as being polynomial time, and this is some kind of limitation on what they can do. And generally this is it. So usually the only thing you assume is that they're a polynomial time algorithm. Uh, you know, you allow them to be probabilistic. That seems fine. And you might ask, polynomial time in what parameter? And generally, um, when you have an encryption scheme, what you really have is like a family of encryption schemes indexed by what's called a security parameter, n. And, you know, the users of the schemes can make n larger and larger uh, according to their taste. You know, you might think of this roughly as like the length of the secret key that's involved in bits. And so, you know, the, the bigger you make n, you know, the more inefficient it is. You know, you can, might need to store 1,000-bit keys, you might need to store 10,000-bit keys or 1,000,000-bit keys. Um, but, you know, you increase these in order to get some better presumed security. And uh, this is the parameter that we mean when we're talking about Eve being polynomial time. Okay, indeed, as I said, you, we usually model um, all the honest parties as also being probabilistic polynomial time algorithms. And there's one more detail which does come up in cryptography. Um, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but um, generally in cryptography theory, you allow the adversaries to be non-uniform uh, models of computation. We talked about this way back in like lecture three or something, what this means. Uh, basically, you imagine they can be circuits, or in other words, that they can have a different algorithm for different values of n. And in turn, what that means is, you, it basically means they can pre-compute any amount of information based only on n, the length of the security parameter. So if you decided, okay, we're going to have keys that are of length 6, 65,536, then, you know, you allow the adversary to have a special, you know, hacking scheme that is based on, you know, 65,536. Okay, but this is not such an important point for this, this lecture. Finally, I want to use this opportunity to make one more definition. Um, so probabilistic, now that we're admitting that our algorithms, our adversarial algorithms can be probabilistic, um, we have to start talking about error probabilities because, you know, okay, in polynomial time, maybe you cannot try all possible two to the 1,000 many secret keys, but you can guess a secret key. And uh, that's a possibility. But of course, you know, you can only guess a 1,000-bit secret key correctly with probably 2 to the minus 1,000, which we consider, you know, an acceptable risk. In other words, it occurs with negligible probability. And um, this is a convenient definition in cryptography theory. Uh, it's a piece of notation. So uh, NEGL, negligible of N, uh, basically literally means this big O notation, 1 over N to the little omega of 1. This is with respect to n going to infinity. Uh, I see another question. I'll answer that in a moment. Uh, so maybe you're not quite used to this little omega of one notation. So this is a function that goes to zero faster than any fixed polynomial. So f of n is at most negligible in n means that for any fixed c, even if you multiply f of n by n to the c, uh, the function still goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So like uh, a big but still negligible function would be something like one over n to the log n or particularly negligible function would be like two to the minus n. Okay, a question was asked, can you give an example of how knowing the length of the key can be useful? Uh, yeah, it's not such a big deal. This is sometimes made, you know, just for technical convenience and arguments, but, um, you know, you might, uh, you know, if, you know, this length of the key is like 65,536, and maybe if it's like a number theoretic protocol, you know, maybe you allow the adversary to know something like what is the first prime number that has 65,536 bits. So that's something that like you can't necessarily compute in poly and 65,000 time, but we allow the algorithm to know this fact. Or, you know, if it's going to be, you know, starting to work with, um, you know, the integers mod 2 to the power of 65,536 or some prime around there, you know, we may allow the adversary to know some you know, generator of the cyclic group of multiplication of this prime or something. So there are some 
things related to the, the security parameter length that might make sense for the adversary to pre-compute. Okay, so with these definitions in hand, um, uh, we can now start talking about uh, a new notion of security based on computational indistinguishability. And we'll have to actually build up some more terminology in order to get there. So uh, I mentioned that this notion of perfect security is saying that like for any two messages, M0 and M1 that Alice might send, when you encode them by the secret, encode them using the secret key, and the secret key is, remember, a random string, a random variable. Perfect security says that these two probability, whoa, probability distributions that you get on ciphertext are exactly the same. And we can weaken perfect security by saying like, well, they don't have to be literally exactly the same probability distribution, as long as there are two probability distributions which cannot be really distinguished by a PPT, probabilistic polynomial time, adversary. So let's make some definitions that will help us uh, encapsulate this. So the first definition we're making is the definition of an ensemble, which is just a, some crypto terminology for a simple concept, basically a sequence of binary string valued random variables. So you know, generally um, we'll be talking a lot about random variables, which are strings. You know, they'll have notation like X or Y or SK. And we usually write a subset, a subscript to indicate how many bits in the string. So, you know, a random variable, a bit string random variable is, you know, denoted like this, but usually there's some, you know, succession of um, security parameters n. And so we actually have a sequence of random strings. And a sequence of random strings is called an ensemble. And we assume that, like, you know, the nth uh, string has some fixed length, which need not actually be n bits, but it should be like some m of n bits, where m of n is a polynomial. Okay, so if you have uh, xn is like a random string, some kind of random string of length n squared, and you have such a distribution for each n, that's an ensemble. Okay, and then the notation is like parentheses xn. Okay, so now here's the key definition. It's a definition for when two ensembles, xn and yn, are computationally indistinguishable. And basically it's saying that a PPT algorithm cannot tell them apart, except, you know, with some like negligible advantage. So you should imagine a game where uh, you have some PPT algorithm A, think of it like an adversary that's trying to um, guess if you're feeding it strings from, drawn from Xn or strings distributed as Yn. And, um, you know, it has to make a binary guess. It outputs like a bit if it thinks it's getting Xn strings or Yn strings. And you can look at the probability that the algorithm, when fed a string xn, outputs, let's say, 1, it outputs 1 or 0, versus the probability it outputs 1 when you give it a yn string. These are two numbers, and if they're both extremely close, if they're like, you know, 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.6000001, that's basically saying that the, the adversary A cannot really tell the difference between the random variables x and the random variables y. Okay, so we say that two ensembles, xn and yn, are computationally indistinguishable, and the notation is this curly equal sign with a c above it. If this holds for all polynomial time algorithms a, uh, this difference in probabilities is at most some negligible function of n. Okay, and this difference is called the advantage a has on uh, ensembles xn and yn, the advantage in distinguishing them. Okay. Uh, I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, please ask. Uh, and so this is a small fact, but this is an equivalence relation. It's not hard to see the, you know, the xn is computationally indistinguishable from xn. I mean, algorithm can't get any advantage there. It's zero. And it's symmetric. The key point is that it uh, has this triangle inequality sort of property, that if xn is computationally indistinguishable from yn, and yn is computationally indistinguishable from zn, and x and z are also computationally indistinguishable. In fact, there's a stronger version of this. This is sort of saying, you know, if you have three ensembles and these two are indistinguishable to, an, to PPT algorithms and these two are, then so are the outside two. You can even extend this to like 10 or 100 or even polynomially many sequences. And um, this fact uh, is like a workhorse fact in probability theory, and it goes by the name hybrid argument or hybrid lemma. And it says, let's say you have quite a few ensembles of random strings, x1 through xt, and t can even depend on n, 
So, but it should be at most polynomial in n. So you might have like n squared different ensembles, for example. And suppose you know that any two like quote unquote adjacent ones like xi and xi plus one are computationally indistinguishable. Then even the first one, x1, and the last one, xt, are also computationally indistinguishable. Now let's just see the proof of this. So here's the proof written out. So we want to show under this assumption that the adjacent ones are indistinguishable, that the endpoint ones are indistinguishable. So sort of what we need to show is if A is any PPT algorithm, then A cannot achieve more than a negligible advantage in distinguishing the x1 ensemble from the xt ensemble. So this is what we're looking at here. Uh, A's advantage at distinguishing the X1 ensemble and the XN ensemble, or XT ensemble. And uh, these are numbers. This is a difference of two numbers. And we can use the ordinary triangle inequality and telescoping to like say that um, two numbers differ by at most, you know, the sum of the differences between, you know, these T intermediary numbers. So this is triangle inequality plus telescoping, I guess. And so now uh, our assumption is that the adjacent ones, xi and xi plus one, are uh, computationally indistinguishable. So that this quantity is a function of n is at most some negligible function. Uh, and we only have t of them. And we are assuming t is at most a polynomial in n. So we have a polynomial in n, a fixed polynomial in n, like n squared, times a negligible function. And we're just saying, well, that's still a neg negligible function. This is a property and like a convenience of this terminology, negligible function. You know. If some like exponentially small quantity, you multiply it by n squared, it's still, you know, exponentially small. Or now replace those words with negligible. It just means you go to zero faster than any polynomial and you're in good shape. Okay, so that's a key tool that's used a lot in cryptography. Uh, let me tell you one more basic fact about computational indistinguishability, which will be important. Let's say uh, x and y are computationally indistinguishable ensembles. And B is a fixed uh, algorithm, even a probabilistic algorithm. And you might imagine that you, uh, B takes as input a string and outputs a string. And now you might say like, let me consider B applied to XN, you know, the output string you get, which is still a random string. If you take a random string X and plug it into B and run B and let B output something, that's a new ensemble, B of X, and B of Y is a new ensemble. And the fact is that, um, these ones are still computationally indistinguishable. So computational indistinguishability is like preserved under applying um, the same algorithm to both ensembles. And well, I was gonna ask you to think about why that's true, but let me just put up a sketch. Let's assume for a con contradiction that they're not indistinguishable, B of X and B of Y, which means there's some algorithm A which distinguishes these two ensembles with non-negligible advantage. You plug in B of X to A and you plug in B of Y to A and A has like a noticeable non-negligible difference in outputting probability, uh, uh, probability difference in outputting one. Well then A combined with B, like first run B, then run A, is a distinguisher that gets non-negligible advantage in distinguishing Xn and Yn. Okay, and that you know, contradicts the assumption that Xn and Yn are uh, computationally indistinguishable. So we're relying on the fact here that you know, the composition of two polynomial time algorithms is another polynomial time algorithm. 